welcome to it's all connected the podcast featuring some of the best coaches and clinicians in the industry sharing their knowledge and experience on every aspect of health and fitness hey there welcome to my channel and today's guest of honor is dr perry nicholson so perry nicholson also known as the lymph doc is a chiropractic physician with primary focus on treating chronic pain and inflammation via lymphatic and vascular systems he is also the owner of stop chasing pain he is an international speaker and educator of self care mojo series lymphatic mojo blood flow mojo tongue mojo lymphatic mojo visceral mojo vagus nerve mojo primal movement mojo so dr perry welcome to my channel how are you doing thank you my friends a lot of mojo there yes <laughs> love it we're going to discuss about it Well, people always ask me what that word means and why do I use it? Well, one because it's not so serious. All right? And and one of the things that we need in healthcare and medicine and rehabilitation is not to be so freaking serious all the time because people are already so stressed out. You need to bring a little air of humor um, you know, and lightheartedness to what you do and there's zero correlation between appearing to be serious and actually being good at what you do. So just because it sounds silly doesn't mean it's not going to change your life and also i love the word one because i love austin powers movies and he talks about mojo but two mojo means magic uh-huh. and i'm talking about the magic of the human body the magic of healing the magic of its capability right the, the magic of of working with another individual to help them feel better and it also means voodoo which means mm-hmm. this sometimes i got no freaking idea why I'd, the stuff i do works or doesn't work magic right that's what it means that's why i use the mojo in uh everything yeah that's amazing i mean it's a great way to remember as well because the word is so catchy so it's pretty great to remember it so yeah exactly so it works that way too that's great <laughs> so uh peri tell me this like you you are a chiropractor so how i mean and how did, how and when did you get inclined towards the vascular and lymphatic system you got attracted to this and how everything works when did it happen that's a great question yeah so you know my my diploma that hangs on my wall initially so that i could get into healthcare <laughs> to help people was from uh chiropractic which i still do some of it honestly and then some people might be familiar with that but i'll be honest with you i do way more than just that and um so i had a lot of great success with helping people in relationship to you know musculoskeletal pain it's cuz that's what mostly came in to see me um, but i was getting very frustrated on why these diagnoses or conditions or labels if you will whatever somebody's been told that they have kept coming back like what's up with that right i i got to be missing something and that's when i started to look at many different other disciplines outside of chiropractic for instance eastern medicine ayurvedic medicine western you know western medicine different approaches and uh also um chinese medicine and a huge influence from uh osteopathic medicine osteopathy which is a big part of what i do because i like their paradigm i like their approach to things because they concentrate a lot on what we'll talk about later which are uh, fluids of the body fluid flow blood flow and lymph flow <clears throat> but um I-, i knew that the i was just focusing too much on one aspect which was the nervous system right uh-huh. and of course the musculoskeletal system and really what spurred that journey if you will was i got really really sick myself and uh, every this is about 10 years ago <clears throat> and i had to go through multiple surgeries and i hit a form of rock bottom where no matter what i was doing i just couldn't get well i was actually on the precipice you know contemplating suicide honestly because i was that bad i had to stop practicing i had to stop teaching i could barely function my brain pretty much just shut off from inflammation and whatever what it, what i had known up to that point was not getting me better and nobody else had a clue either so then that's when i realized you know what i'm going to have to rescue myself i'm going to have to figure this stuff out on my own so i pretty much went back to the simple basic fundamental drawing board of how one individual cell works <laughs> and then i just expanded that out to the trillions of other ones and the body that have to work together 
So now that's why I look at all the different systems mm-hmm. of the body. That's pretty much <clears throat> how I got here was hitting a ultimate form of suffering that nearly took me out. What a journey. What a journey. I mean, the way you bounced back, um, I mean, from thinking to commit suicide to where you are today, it's wow. Well, that just goes to show you the resiliency of the body and how it's always trying to heal you. And even when you're stuck in the quicksand right now, it doesn't mean that you have to be. Hmm. You actually have to just change the way you think. Because if you're still suffering and you're not feeling any better, the body's Um, trying to help you. You're just missing something. And you have to think outside of the proverbial box, which, which, which is why I don't put myself in boxes at all anymore. And you have to think outside the traditional norm of what everybody else is doing. Hmm. Or you look at uh, how different things of the body that seem completely unrelated might be related. Because here's a little news flash for you. They're always related because they're in the same person. <laughs> you understand? That's true. That's true. But that's true. That's not how we treat things. We treat things and we isolate and hmm. we do reductionistic health care, which has its place in learning things, but you usually learn a lot about one individual thing. But that's not going to help you much when you realize that everything in the body works together and everything changes when it works with something else and nothing ever works alone. So you can't just focus on one body part and expect to have long-term results in relationship to chronic pain and chronic disease and illnesses like that. You have to look at the more holistic, full body, big picture, which we talk about all the time. But for some reason, we say it, but we don't actually do it. (laughs) This is this is very important because like a a very small example that I want to share is that uh, I was reading a post of yours where you say if the lymph nodes are are in a swollen state here, so it means the teeth are not getting remineralized and the toxins are not getting flushed out pretty well from the system. So. I mean, one could be mouth breathing or one could have like not so optimal breathing mechanism. Uh, Hence, this is happening. And because of that remineralization is not happening. So that like people who have cavities, they have to get this extracted because it has become so bad. And if the molars fall out, then our sense of grounding on that side uh, is reduced our ability to produce force into the ground through that side, that left versus right compression into that, I mean, force into the ground, that capability reduces, which might result in our hips or thorax or even the cranium uh, to, I mean, not being able to change shape as good as they would have if the molar would have been there. I mean, it's crazy how everything (laughs) is so connected from the lymph, starting from the lymph node to mouth breathing to internal rotation and pelvis and ribcage changing shape like it's yeah well well said i mean you know um that's i heard a phrase once it was my friend eric cobb from z health program which i like a lot he says that people are allowed to have more than one problem Mm -hmm. so what that means is that when somebody comes on in and then they point to where it hurts So they already took care of most of the work because they're pointing to where it hurts, right? And so you know that there's potentially a problem there, not necessarily, you just know that it hurts. But you can have a lot more other areas that are contributing to that that you're not even looking at. Yes. right. That seem far removed from the shoulder because everybody's just focused on what's screaming the loudest, which is the shoulder. But that's what my company name means, Stop Chasing Pain. It doesn't say stop treating pain. I want you to treat pain. I I don't want you to chase it. Chase it means that you only treat where everybody just points, right? Because it's going to, it just migrates. It goes all over the place. "Ah, Today my shoulder hurts and then my hip hurts and my back hurts. Well, a lot of that is your body just doing its own uh, compensations and adaptations to try to take away pain from one spot. And it just wears down another one. 
it, it's only got so many options that it can do before it runs out of options. And then it says, dude, I'm out of options and I need some help. Mm. And the help signal is pain. And sometimes it's going to punch you right in the face and it hurts. But a lot of times it just creeps up slowly over time and we tend to ignore mm. those uh, help signals and we we smother the pain. So it's really simple in my world, man. Um, you always start where it hurts because people expect you to. Oh. And it shows that I'm listening to you. It shows that I hear you. It shows empathy. But then I want you to look everywhere else. Right. Which could be terrifying because nothing is more terrifying than the idea of unlimited possibilities. But that's mm -hmm. the way it works with the body. It can be coming from anywhere yeah. and show up any place it wants. And it's not the same for every person, hmm. you know, but, but that's why you study and that's why you, you, you do the work, right? You chop the wood, you carry the water. What that means is you get in the arena and you learn it hmm. because that's what your job is, right? But that's why not everybody's in healthcare. There's a lot of people in healthcare that shouldn't be in it either. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're looking for cookie cutter solutions to uh, yeah. uh, diagnosis and labels. And I'm like, wrong. That doesn't exist. It's a starting point. Hmm. It's not the start and end point. Yeah. That makes sense. Absolutely. So there's a there's a post of yours where you say drainage precedes supply. Yes. Yes. Let's go deep into it. We are now getting that's from osteo that's uh, that's from osteopathic medicine. That's an osteopathic, osteopathy, fundamental, basic foundation. Drainage precedes supply. So precedes means it comes first, mm -hmm. right? So let's, let's talk about what I mean by that. <clears throat> let's take a cell, for instance. Remember I told you I went back and I just concentrated on an individual cell? That's what you need to do because you've got trillions of them. And if you can figure out how one works, you can figure out how they all work. Because it's the same, they call it, they have different names, but it's the same basic fundamental process of what they need. So cells need a supply of nutrients, right? What kind of nutrients? Well, big ones are glucose and oxygen are two big top ones. <clears throat> Without those, you're dead quick, fast, and in a hurry. And if you have a decreased amount of those, you're going to feel pretty horrific and you're not going to get better. And they also need your other nutrients. So that's why you eat. So you get nutrients in, right? And there's your vitamins, your minerals, your fats, your hormones, your amino acids, blah, 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 all that stuff that's located mostly in your blood plasma. Um, so where does that supply come from? How does it get to a cell? That's through your vascular system. Your blood flow system is the major nutritional conduit. That's blood flow arteries that way okay so that's the supply chain in <clears throat> then <clears throat> once your cells use all those nutrients by going through an energetic process right so they take those nutrients and then they go in the mitochondria and then they form the atp through the krebs cycle and then that way i can heal recover and regenerate and i can make new ones so i can be a monster tomorrow and then anytime you make energy you create waste Hmm. And the waste has to drain out like plumbing in a house. Got to drain it. Well, how does the body drain fluids? Well, two big routes are the veins of the body. So that's also a supply chain, but it's going out. Hmm. Right? Most of your blood resides in your veins. <clears throat> and the other one is your lymphatics. And the lymphatics are basically your mini toilet sewage system of the body that kills bad things and shunts them out. And where does it bring them to? Holy cow, it brings them right to your veins. So it goes back into the veins anyway. So drainage precedes supply means this. <clears throat> what happens if you don't get the fluids out, the toxins out, the waste out? that the cells use. Because when the cells work, they make metabolic waste. Mm -hmm. And that stuff's got to get out. What happens if it doesn't get out? Where does it stay? 
inside you. Hmm. And guess what? They're not supposed to stay in there. And when they do, your immune system says, dude, these things aren't supposed to be here. We got to kill it. Oh. And what's it going to create? Inflammation. Oh. Right? So your immune system kicks in and your nervous system kicks in via your sympathetic nervous system to fight and protect you. Right? And that's where the inflammation response comes on air. Right? So once that happens, you know, on the other side, when we go to therapies, we want to try to increase the supply to things, right? We want to increase oxygen. We want to increase blood flow to things. So we want to try to get the supply to an area that's been hurt. But here's the problem. You're not going to be able to get anything into the cells that you can't get out. So you have to remove what's already there first. Then you look at the supply side, right? Which are the nutrients and the oxygen and all that sort of stuff. What that means basically is this, is that you have to concentrate on the veins of the body and the lymph of the body to drain the toxins, drain the metabolic waste. And you can do that through your organs as well. Skin is a big one. Kidneys are a big one. You're right. Liver is a big one. They're your detox things. Uh, and then you go to the nutrient side. Problem is, everybody does it backwards. Hmm. Everybody tries to improve your diet. That's the supply side. Uh, they try to improve your supplements. Take these supplements. It's going to improve your nutrients. Well, maybe. If, if it can get to the cells, maybe. All right. Uh, and if it, get, so if it can get to the cells, yeah, provided, yeah. Right, yeah. If it, but I'm going to tell you, if you are all black, backed up in your plumbing and you have the toxins around the cells because it's not draining, it ain't getting there. Hmm. And just because it gets there doesn't mean it's getting in. You follow? It's got to get in. And the body's pretty smart. It doesn't let stuff in that it can't get out because that's just stupid. Because it says, I can't even handle what I've already got. And you want me to do more? What? So all that stuff just does nothing. Or it barely keeps you hanging on. So you're surviving and you're not dead, but you're not thriving and you're not healing. Because those are two different things. Mm. Right? And then we work on the supply side where I'm going to massage you. I'm going to put electric stem. I'm going to put laser. I'm going to do everything to an area to increase all that blood flow. And I'm like, well, that's a good start, yeah. but you need to improve the outflow first. Then you do the inflow. If you switch those two things around, your results are going to be vastly different. Mm -hmm. So drainage means that. Drainage means toxins out, right? Whatever kind of, I don't care what you want to call toxins, it's just waste. Right. Out first, then nutrients in. What that means in my world is this. I always, always, always work the veins and the limp first. When I do any manual therapy work. Because that's the drainage part. Then I go to the supply side. Right. That makes sense. But here's the cool thing. <clears throat> the nerves, the arteries, the veins, and the lymph always work together, and they're always side by side. So when you work one, you always work the other. I want you to think about that for a minute, because now you're thinking, well, if that's the case, why does it matter what I do? to an area because i'm always working all of those right well that's what i'm going to tell you then you got to understand why you're working one area instead of another it's where you treat those places first second third and fourth that makes a difference on how things flow so it's not just working the flow it's the order in which you work the flow makes all the difference that's the key because right now everybody just pushes on places and they they massage things and they treat things usually where where somebody points and in my world that's the last place i go 
because I have to look at the supply chain. Does that makes sense. And we'll do case examples later if we have time, and I'll break yeah. it down for you. You'll see how simple. Sure, sure. But that's the basic. I know I'll talk for like 15 minutes on those three words, but those three words changed everything that I do mm -hmm. in my uh, teaching approach, my education approach, and my treatment approach, and my own healing. Because all those years, I was too busy looking at the supply side. Oh, I wasn't God. looking at the drainage side. Yes. That makes sense? Yes. I mean, this, if the space is already occupied, like why would the body welcome foreign substances? Let, let it yeah, leave the space it, first. It wants to. It wants but it to, but have the, it doesn't have access. It doesn't have right. the capacity to do it. Right? Because the body's really smart, man. It, you're already a toxic hot mess. <laughs> why is it going to add to it? So what it does is that stuff goes in, but it just goes right back out right? Through some drainage pathways. But a lot of that stuff's also going to remain, even if it doesn't make its way into the cell. So you're over the years, over the months, weeks, years, you're accumulating mm. all of that metabolic waste that can't get out. Oh. So cell, cells live in liquid, man. They live in fluid. Stuff's got to go through the fluid, to get in, stuff's got to go out of the fluid to get out. And if you have crappy fluid, you're going to stay sick, period. Sure. So when I work tissues, yeah, fast is cool. Everybody's talking about it, the big buzzword. <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking to myself, how does me working this fascia affect how fluids are flowing everywhere? Uh, Not just where I have my fingers. OK, not just the area that I'm working on. And here's what's cool, man. They consider blood and lymph to be liquid connective tissue, to be liquid fascia. So when your blood system, your arteries and your veins and your lymph become stagnant, that changes the shape of cells. Yes. Right? Of course it does, because the cells have to conform to their environment. So then the cells change their shape, which changes what? Tightness and tension and what they call adhesions in the body or fibrosis is more of a term for that. And then it clamps down on fluid flow even more. So it's not just that you have to work the fascia. You got to work the liquid fascia too, everywhere. Because if you don't, you're never going to change the ultimate supply chain to the area that had the pain in the first place. What that means is this. You never just treat where it hurts. That's this what that makes means. So much, this makes so much sense. Like uh, in the biomechanics world uh, that I'm involved in, they say like you are 99% water by molecule and that 1% is like viscoelastic stuff. So it shape change is like the constant like body is constantly changing shape from the from the microscopic level to the macroscopic level and this makes so much sense cells changing shape to like connective tissue from like from the very microscopic level to the macroscopic level where, where we see people with like those valgus knees or varus knees everything is like bone uh, the force placed on the bone over a year over the period of years and then changing shape like the principles remain the same like systems yeah all the systems are there but then the principles remain the same this is so interesting wow. well if you think about it macroscopic is only macro because it's composed of a lot of micro exactly exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> yep and <laughs> there's a post of yours like uh, laughter is the best medicine because of the movement of the diaphragm that happens because of laughter. Oh yeah, the yeah. Jean Pierre Brown quote. Yeah. Right. So this is what I want you to dive deep into the role of diaphragm in health, immunity, uh, and prosperity. Yeah, that's a huge one. That, that quote was that went kind of viral. A ton of people shared that one in relationship to uh, 
how laughing causes more motion in your muscular diaphragm, which, which we'll go over in a moment, because not everybody knows what that is. Um, and it, it can make you feel better. And why? Because it changes, it changes pressure. Yes. It changes pressure. Yes. And here's my next point and question. What moves fluids in the body? Pressure. Pressure. Pressure change through breathing. The pressure change, volume change that happens in the body. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Even the pressure of me touching on it, even the pressure of you breathing, even the barometric pressure outside. That's why some people get more pain on a day when it's going to be raining than when it's not raining. Because mm -hmm. you change pressure. And that changes how the mechanoreceptors uh, um, react to pressure and they can cause pain. Right? So there's a lot of stuff happening in the world that it's contributing to your, your pain that you're not aware of. And pressure is a big one. And nerves respond to pressure mm -hmm. a lot. Right? So, but yeah, when you laugh, you also, what? You also, one, you're laughing. So that makes you feel pretty freaking good. So you can you can change your nervous system from the fight or flight to the relaxing one. Oh. But when you cough, you contract your abdominal muscles really quickly, right? <clears throat> so one, laughter is one of the most effective ways for you to contract your quote unquote core abdominal brace muscles without trying to figure out how. Uh, exactly. So you just did a whole core workout without even trying. You ever, ever laugh so hard, your belly hurts, you cramp, you're like, <laughs> that's because you're firing everything on all cylinders. Now, another thing that does that is throwing up, but oh. you should laugh more than you throw up. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, so yeah, but your diaphragm is a muscle that's a dome shape muscle, kind of like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And it sits in the lower part of your rib cage above your organs. So it's like the umbrella over your organs. And it moves based on pressure because it attaches to a lot, of, attaches to your organs, first of all, but many people don't realize that. And it attaches to your spine. So breathing in and out, moving your diaphragm moves the spine but also gives the spine what they call stability or stabilization, helps hold the spine. So that's why when you don't breathe through the diaphragm, you're much more prone to having low back pain because you don't have good control in your lower back, right? But when you inhale, breathing in, preferably in through your nose and not your mouth, because when you breathe in through your nose, you automatically drive more motion into the diaphragm by doing that. So inhale through the nose, not the mouth. Your nose is for breathing, your mouth is for eating, okay? So when you breathe in through your nose, you increase pressure more in your abdomen than in your chest. And then that takes that umbrella and starts to push it down so it goes towards the floor. So it pushes towards the floor and all of the organs that sit below it get pushed down with it so you're moving organs hmm. right and you're pushing towards the floor but you need to catch those organs underneath so they don't end up on the floor yeah. <laughs> then that's where you have what they call your pelvic diaphragm some people call it your pelvic floor that's a hammock a reverse diaphragm at the bottom yeah. that receives the pressure okay and if that thing starts to go, those are the people that can't control the bladder, the bowel, or if they cough, they pee themselves, or they have incontinence. So the inhale increases pressure, mm. right? So it increases pressure, and that's going to pump some fluid. Then when you uh, exhale, right, you breathe out. You can breathe out through your nose or your mouth. Most often through the mouth, I would encourage in the beginning because you can typically make much longer exhales via the mouth than you can the nose until you practice. And when you're breathing out, the diaphragm starts to relax and then now it comes up and then the organs below that were pushed down now get sucked up through the top. So they go back up. 
So basically, it's like a piston hmm. of moving stuff down, moving stuff up, oh. right? So every time you use a, a muscle, for instance, like if you're doing a bicep, if you flex and make a bicep, you're contracting your bicep muscle, right? So you're strengthening it. Then if I start to let my bicep muscle relax and I let the dumbbell come away, so I'm also contracting that muscle, but it's starting to relax, right? Well, that's the same thing that happens for the diaphragm because the diaphragm is a muscle. And many people have diaphragms that are weak because they don't use them, right? Or they're stuck because they're so tight because you haven't used them in a long time or there's poor mm -hmm. blood flow around the diaphragm because you haven't taken a look at blood flow in your abdomen. So whenever you breathe in and the diaphragm pushes down, that's called concentric movement, shortening. So it's like taking the, making the bicep muscle, that's a concentric movement. Then when you let the dumbbell go down, that's called an eccentric movement. So you're letting it go down. And then when you exhale, the diaphragm, it comes back up. That's called eccentric motion. The thing I want you to understand is that the muscle never relaxes at all on either one. It just depends on how much it's contracting. Yeah. The so it contracts when you breathe in and it contracts when you breathe out. And what you'll, what you'll find when you get into strength training is that the eccentric part, is what makes you really ungodly, hellaciously strong. Mm -hmm. So that's why you want to make long exhales because it strengthens your diaphragm. If muscle gets stronger and then long exhales also increase signals to your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the system for relaxation, growth, and healing. So that's the one that you need so you can relax from the stress response right and when you can increase parasympathetic activity you decrease tension and stress right and when you decrease tension and stress what do you automatically increase fluid flow hmm. because tissue that's really really tight and really really tense decreases blood flow because you got less room to move because everything's too damn tight, right? So that's why they say the number one way that you can decrease stress, take away the some of the sympathetic dominant fight or flight survival mechanism to relax, which can help decrease pain significantly, particularly in your lower back, but anywhere, mm -hmm. is to practice good diaphragmatic breathing. Because it changes pressure, which changes blood flow, which changes your nervous system, which changes your your reaction and your perception to stress. Hmm. That makes sense. So yes. when when people talk about breathing through the diaphragm, they always talk about you know, core stabilization and stability and stuff like that, which is which is great and helping your um, nervous system. I just want you to think about everything that's underneath that umbrella that mm -hmm. you're moving, which is where most of your fluids live. There's a ton of blood flow in your gut mm -hmm. and a ton of lymphatic fluid in your gut. Not to mention what else sits there. The major pipes of fluid flow in your body, particularly your abdominal aorta, and your inferior vena cava. If you have an issues with those, you're gonna have an issue where? Everywhere else, because that's the big main pipe that supplies everything else, mm -hmm. right? The only way you're getting any blood to your, your hands and your feet and any part of your body is through that freaking pipe. So it's a good idea to make sure you pay attention to where the big pipes are. One way to do that is through breathing through your diaphragm, and most people don't. Oh. Most people don't. You just teach them that simple. It's actually simple, but it's not simple because they haven't done it in so long. They yeah, can't exactly. even find it. They don't even know where to search for finding it. That's why you have to 
teach them. And the best way to teach them is to uh, touch, use touch. So they can yeah. feel where they need to be moving from. Yes. To, to yes. get it. Because it, it's like you might as well be talking Martian to them. When you say, I want you to, you know, expand your belly and breathe through here. They're like, I have no, I don't even know what you're talking about. They can't find it. True. The sense, uh, they don't have that awareness because they have been patterned in a way, certain way for so long that they don't even know what to do. And that is when like uh, putting hands on the rib cage to feel front to back expansion, like see how it goes. That is when they, oh, okay, this is what I feel. Like perfect. This is ribcage expansion. This is how it should happen. And you see how your how you feel everything going. Like you feel a movement happening inside the system. Like yes, like this is exactly what I want you to do without my help. So teaching them in a way where they get a lot of feedback, sensory feedback, and then slowly moving on where they do it independently. But yeah, it d d definitely takes time, especially with people who have this chronic neck tightness. Like everything is like elevated, rib flared. Like they have yeah. The diaphragm hasn't really moved for so many years. So it takes a lot of practice too. It's not gonna yes. happen overnight because what you what you'll find is that the, you may do that for a period of time, but when you go back to life and you start exactly. doing things, you'll you'll fall back into those ha subconscious habits. And then next thing you know, you'll check and say, Holy cow, I'm actually breathing through my mouth or I'm holding my breath and I'm and I'm not breathing. So part of the things that I teach people is just to, to pick like what's feasible for them three times, five times, 10 times during the day and just spot check your breathing to see how you're breathing at that standpoint. And then most of them will be startled of how much they're not breathing through the nose and through the diaphragm. But the whole point, people always say, how can you improve breathing? And the first part is awareness that you need to. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because you can't control something you're not aware of, oh. right? And then when you become aware of it and then you train it, then the nervous system will remember. It's just yes. a little bit, there's cobwebs on it and it's it's dusty because you haven't done it in a while. You'll regroove those, what they call those neural pathways. And then all of a sudden you'll be finding yourself breathing like you did when you were a baby because everybody breathed through the diaphragm when you were a baby because that's just the way you're supposed to do it. You just change that pattern up through life because of what? Gravity and stress Gravity is what did stress. it. Yes, yes, yeah. Right? So just practice that awareness. Then it, it can, it, it may take you a couple of weeks, may take you a couple of months, but it can change your life. Hmm. I tell people all the time, if you can't control your breathing, you're always going to struggle to get well. It's a fundamental, right? It's the same thing with hydration. If you're not hydrating, you're never going to get well. If you're not sleeping, you're never going to get well, right? And then maybe one of the reasons you're not sleeping is because you're not drinking water and you're not breathing through your yeah, diet. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So connected there. Right? So how you, somebody said a quote once, I think it was like, how you sleep is all dependent on how you wake up which means it's what you do all day long that determines how well you sleep. Everybody goes after the sleep part. I'm like, well, what about the rest of the day? Oh. <laughs> if you look at that, then you'll probably sleep. Right? Because most people are not doing these big basics and the fundamentals that can make a difference in the sleep. So those are three boxes right there that, you know, that are huge for healing. And most people don't most people don't know about the breathing part. But we we think that they do because listen, we live in a small little bubble where everybody on this podcast or that follows you probably knows about breathing, and then you take it for granted. You're like, ah, man, do you have to talk about breathing again? We always talk about breathing. Well, you need to because yeah, without it, you're dead. Not exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I want you to keep talking about it because I want you to remember that 99.9% .9 of the people out there that have no freaking idea about breathing. Yes. Those are the ones that we're doing this for. I'm not doing this for you. Yes, exactly. I'm doing this for them via you. Yes. So yes. they need to know these basics and the fundamentals, right? Because, I mean, without, I mean, what is it? You can last long time without food, what, a couple of weeks? Take away your water, you got a couple of days. If I take yeah. away your breath, 
Lights out. If I take, what if I take away your blood flow? Oh. You ever seen a mixed martial arts fight and what they call a rear naked choke? Uh, I've right? seen them. That's where they they grab. They basically grab their forearm around your neck. Oh yes, it is. When yes. you're, yeah. So they're choking you out inside the oh. UFC mat. Right? Mm. Why did you pass out within ten seconds and go lights out? Because I just put pressure on your carotid artery that sends blood flow to your brain, and you're out. Mm -hmm. So I want you to realize how powerful the side of the neck is in relationship to blood flow, right? And you can decrease that when you have a lot of tension in the neck. And when you don't breathe through your diaphragm because you're using the neck too much, and you're using the upper chest too much, and you're choking off blood flow, not enough to make you go lights out, but enough to where your brain isn't going to function at optimal because you have a poor blood flow to the brain and your brain needs about 25% of the available oxygen in the entire body in order to function. So you're slowly starving your brain of what? The supply side, nutrients and oxygen. So blood flow is everything, man. Blood flow. People say, Doc, why are you treating my neck? My neck doesn't hurt. Well, well, because that's the blood flow to your brain, man. That's why I'm treating your neck. Because ultimately, I want to make sure that your brain is healthy. Because the brain is where pain lives. If you have poor blood flow to the brain, you will experience more pain. I'm going to say that again. If you have poor blood flow to the brain, you will experience pain. Because pain and low oxygen always, always go together. Always go together. So it's no joke. That's why when you look at the blood flow to and from the brain, it's massive. Massive. And most of your lymphatic system is located in your neck. Hmm. And the lymphatic system is what? Drainage. Drainage system. So let me ask you a question. Why would nature put so many of your lymphatic drainage things in your neck? Near what do you got to drain? Near around the brain? Yeah, that's, you got to drain the, the brain. Spot. Yeah, that's the hot spot. Yeah. Yeah. So if you just think about the way the body is lined out, it's a heap of common sense. Like, why in the hell? <laughs> Where they put all the lymph nodes in the neck. Well, because it's got to drain the nerves in the neck and the sympathetic nervous system up in the neck with the ganglion that sit there and, and the brain, right? And it wasn't only until recently that science even discovered that you have a lymphatic drainage system around the brain. They didn't think that the brain had a lymphatic drainage system, right? First of all, I want you to think how stupid that statement is. Like, you really think that the most metabolically active organ in the body is not going to have a way to drain itself? Just because you're not smart enough to find it yet doesn't mean it's not there. It's there, and it's working all the time. We just didn't see it, right? So the brain drains its toxins through what? Veins and lymph and cerebrospinal fluid. Everything's through fluid. Everything's through fluid. And you will, I'm going to say this now, you will not, you will not drain the brain efficiently if you don't breathe through your diaphragm. Why? Because the pressure and the abnormal pressure in your abdomen affects the pressure in your skull. That's why. Big picture. Yes. You have to look at everything. Yes. That makes sense? Uh, I tell my clients, uh, divide your day into two, two, two kinds of activities. Like one activity which requires your extreme focus, like you're writing an exam or you're uh, riding a bike on the road or something. That time, forget about breathing and all. Do what, whatever instinctive, you have to just focus on the activity. But... A majority of our day is spent doing activities which do not require like 100% of our focus. Like if you're watching a movie or listening to music, 
at that time, like you're scrolling on Instagram on your bed during those activities, make sure you're breathing very slow, silent, nasal, where you feel the chest expand and compress because now you don't have to put in 100% focus on the activity. You can put some towards your breathing and that over a period of time will create like huge changes because now you're creating day-to-day -day life changes. So that has been helpful. Yeah, I love that, man. That's perfect because you're you're getting people to be actually in the moment. Yes. Right? They're not thinking about anything else but what they're doing right now, which also decreases the stress response because you're not thinking about what happened yesterday and what's coming up tomorrow. You're just in the now, right? in the present moment. And that gives you more body awareness, somatic awareness, or what they call interoception. Interoception is I-N-T-E-R-O-ception, which means just paying attention to the senses, the sensations from inside yourself. Mm. And that deep, that significantly decreases the stress response. But you can tap into that. And I'm going to give you, where do you think most of your interoceptors live? Back to that gut, back to those organs. Uh, that's where they live. That's why breathing from the diaphragm is a life changer. And I have a novel idea. How about you massage your abdomen every day? Mm. And you breathe through your diaphragm. Oh, brother, mm. you can check the wind box right there like crazy. Now, I learned in Eastern medicine years ago from studying Qigong, actually, which is a kind of a medical form of movement in Eastern medicine. If you take the time to massage your abdomen 20 minutes a day, you'll change your life. You'll change pain everywhere, no matter what. It's, it's transformational, crazy. It's just getting somebody to do it. So then I say, how about we do this, man? Can you give me two minutes today? Yeah, I'll give you two minutes. If they say no, then you're not ready to get well yet. You can move along and come back when you're ready because I don't have the time. And I'm not kidding you. If you're not ready to help yourself, I'm not going to waste my energy. So you start off with two minutes and then the person will start to feel, Doc, I don't know if this is crazy or not, but I did those two minute things and I feel freaking awesome. I'm like, okay, well, how about you keep doing that? You think you want to woke up to three? Hells yeah, I'll work up to three. <laughs> then you can build Ooh, up to yeah. 20. And then they realize, I wish I was doing this my whole life. There you go. Right? Just got to get thought. Everybody's got a gut problem. They just don't know it yet. Oh. I read an article uh, that day where, where it wrote that IBS, the one of the biggest factors behind IBS is gravity and that comes along with diaphragm so the the stagnancy of the diaphragm and then the stagnancy of the fluids and everything so connected ibs gravity <laughs> straight yeah big time well it's all about energy right it's all about yeah well they, they have a if you think about it this way if most of your blood flow and the majority of your lymph flow is in your gut what do you think is going to happen to the gut when those don't work well? Hmm. I don't know about you, but if I was your gut, I'd be irritable too. Yes. <laughs> because I can't freaking breathe and I can't get rid of my own poop waste. Right? And so they're finding through the research that lymphatic issues are a cause of Crohn's disease. Hmm. So if you have a gut problem in my world, you have a lymph problem. If you have a lymph problem, you have a gut problem. And if you have a lymph problem, what else do you have? You also have a blood flow problem because they always go together. And if those are compromised, what else is compromised? The nerves are compromised. So everything is compromised. So you have to work them all. Yes. True. You have to work them all. Our, our, but nobody, our, nobody our, ever really touches the gut. Nobody, nobody yeah. really goes after the gut. What's the number one reason why they don't go after the gut? Because it doesn't hurt. Ah, but it gives symptoms everywhere else. So, and they treat yeah. symptoms and they treat like isolated uh, symptoms. Like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. 
what's the biggest symptom people usually complain of that's getting worse, not better, and all the research and all the stuff that we do is not improving? The lower back. No. Yeah. So what I tell people is, well, how about you do this? Why don't you treat the lower back and flip them over and do a lot of stuff to that belly? Then you come tell me the differences that you're feeling. Because I'm going to ask you a question. Where does the blood flow to your back come from? You better be telling me the front. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Front. Yep. Of course it does. It comes from the aorta in the front. Aorta. Right? And when you got swelling and inflammation and damage and fluid and metabolic waste around the back, where does that go? To the front. To the front. So in order to help the back, what do you do first? Drainage precedes what? Supply. Yeah. Yeah. So in my world, that means you always work the stomach and gut before you work your back. That's what that means. Right? That's it's vastly different than me treating the back first and then going to the stomach second. They're the same two spots, but the results are completely different based on the order that I treat them in, based on what premise. Drainage precedes supply. Right? That's not a small thing, man. That's everything. Well, I just told you. Mm. But I just told you. And then when you understand how fluids ultimately go, I'm going to tell you, where does all that inflammation and swelling and toxins and metabolic waste from your back injury ultimately have to go? Well, then you're probably going to say it's going to get out to the, the, the kidneys, to urine, but in order to get there, it's got to go through the blood. And in mm -hmm. order to get that way, it's got to go all the way up back to the heart. Mm -hmm. At your collarbone. So it's got to go all the way up there. Then it goes back out through the arterial system, through the arteries. Okay? Then that puts it through the kidneys, it's gonna put it through the liver, it's gonna get it through the skin, it's gonna do all those things like that. So you have to look at the whole supply chain. And then once again, that's why it comes down to the breathing part. Because when you breathe through the diaphragm, you're influencing what? Pressure around your aorta, mm -hmm. which influences blood flow to your, your back. See all this stuff makes sense? If you think about it. Absolutely. <laughs> There's got to be, there's got to be, I want people to have a reason for doing what you're doing and give me a reason of why you're doing it in this place first no. and not that place. That's what I want to know. Right. And don't tell me because it hurts there. That's the wrong answer. <laughs> right. The, the importance of the, uh vagus nerve and everything that's surrounding you know the cranium if you could go deep about that all the like the lymphatic system vagus nerve the importance of those nerves yeah dude i got a skull and a whole skeleton right behind me there i don't know if you can see it yeah uh, yeah you do too you do too i see oh, it yeah. there. there you go yeah you and me we could hang out man we could have a good <laughs> oh yeah that's huge Right, the, the blood. First of all, we're talking about the blood supply to the brain, but that's where the vagus nerve sits. That be the brain stem, particularly what's called your medulla. Not that that makes any difference for our conversation, but that needs a lot of uh, blood flow. And where the hell does that blood flow come from? Well, the collarbone. Gotta go up, right? So. That that's why you always have to look at the blood flow to the structures of the the brain because the vagus nerve is included mm. in that. Right? So a lot so of people wonderful. try to improve function of the vagus nerve by going after the gut because the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number ten, goes to the gut, goes to the organs. They call it the gut brain axis, right? And so there's a communication signal there, but you can't neglect the vagus nerve in the brain either. You can't just go after the gut part. Hmm. You got to go after the brain part. So that's why you have to work the uh, the skull and the muscles of the, the neck. Even the TMJ and jaw and face muscles and all those, right? Because that's going to make a difference on the blood flow uh, to the vagus nerve. And that's going to influence how, what your gut does.
Well, you got those. So that, that's huge. Because if if the vagus nerve gets good good blood flow in the brain, it'll send good gut flow, good blood flow to the gut. Yeah. Because the vagus yeah. nerve gives the blood flow to the gut. And also when I mean, because of the gravity and sedentary lifestyle and the breathing not being optimal, like people when they develop a forward head or this military neck, this foramen magnum, this the space here really suffers when the heads go. Yeah. The airways constricted, that this space suffers. And because of that, all everything that is coming up from here suffers along with it. And then we can trace it back to the diaphragm. Like the diaphragm isn't moving, and that is why the body has to compensate in order to like, yeah. in order to face gravity. So it has to bring the forward head or military neck. So such interconnected system. Yeah. So you, you know, a lot of people have that forward head posture, you know, and then they put a lot of excess tightness and tension again yeah. on the back of yeah. the head which is going to interfere with the vertebral arteries that are one of the that and the internal carotid artery the two main blood flow pipes to your brain and with a forward head posture you're choking off both right that's why the muscles in the back of that head are always so tight and tender and uh, people get headaches or they want you to rub back there and make them feel a little bit better but you also need to work that in conjunction, like you said before, with your breathing from the diaphragm at the same time. Because they're usually gonna go um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. together. Yeah, and then when you when you stretch your head forward like that and you come forward, you can see that you're you're elongating some nerves in the front of the neck because you go a little bit long in the neck here, and then you're putting some stretch on some nerves that sit there and particularly your vagus nerve that runs down the side of your neck but that tissue can be tightened through there and then when nerve they want to stretch they can't stretch and then you can actually crimp or put pressure around that nerve and doesn't glide and then you irritate the nerve you get dysfunction in the vagus nerve right that a lot has of a huge impact on the autonomic autonomic nervous system. Like people go, go very sympathetic, easily irritable, uh, irritated. Uh, they have brain fade moments. They are very angry. They're not very calm, composed, relaxed, happy. Because yeah, right. Which is most of the humans on this earth right about now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody's just like, you, you say hi to people that punch you in the face. I mean, everybody's just on edge right now, right? But you also, that forward head posture, you lose motion in the, the bones of the neck and oh, the skull. Cranium, yeah. And then you, you trap down. I mean, all those nerves that are up in your head, they got to come out somewhere, <laughs> right? They come out through the holes or those foramen that you talk about. And then they got to go to the places on your head, neck, face, throat, all, all sorts of reasons in there. I, 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 I was going through your IG uh, profile and found a very interesting video where you were smelling uh, fragrances using one nostril at a time. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If you could go deep about that, I would lo love to know, like, what, what was the goal and what we, what, you, what you were trying to accomplish through that? So if you could dive deep into that. Yeah, well, smell, first of all, is really powerful neurological tool to change uh, emotions in the body. They find that smell is tied to emotional memories more than any other sense. Mm -hmm. That's why you can smell maybe, for instance, my mom's great apple pie recipe or something, and then it'll take you back to a moment. Or you can smell a toxic substance, for instance, that can take you back to a very traumatic moment that you had in your life. So smells are very powerful in changing the nervous system at a conscious level and a subconscious level. For healing. 
but you know the the, the brain uses a uh, sensory input coming into it from its environment to give it information on where it is and what it needs to do next so sensory input is data information right what you see what you hear what you taste what you feel what you smell so all that stuff goes in and then your brain will take that information and then interpret it telling itself a story based on the story that you told yourself before hmm. so it repeats patterns including pain or it's going to tell itself a story that somebody else told you to believe <laughs> hence the placebo and nocebo effect oh. very often more so the nocebo effect which is by far more powerful in my opinion yes um and then, then you'll get an output based on that interpretation. So something comes in, like you smell it, then you tell yourself a story based on the smell, and then your output is your movement, your response. Okay? And they know that pain is an output signal, not an input signal. So pain doesn't come up, pain goes out. Hmm. Pain goes out after what? After the story you tell yourself. That, that's why pain is all perception. It's not yeah. objective, yeah. it's subjective. Yes. subjective. What that means is that two people can feel the same stimulus, tell themselves different stories and get a different pain output based on the same stimulus, right? So sensory input can drive, alter the pain output. So what you do is you use smell to make a difference in that. And the, the NOS, the, it's very interesting without going too deep in the rabbit hole is that you've got a left brain and a right brain and you got nerves on either side and they, all the sensory nerves are crisscrossed basically. So stuff that goes in on the right side, I'll get stuff on the left, I feel uh, goes the left side of the brain, stuff on the left side of the brain goes the right side of the brain with sensory input, except for smell. Smell goes same side. So your right nostril stimulates the right side of your brain. Your left nostril stimulates the left side of your brain. Mm -hmm. That everything else would cross the other side. If you hear in your left ear, it goes to the right brain. If you hear in your right ear, it goes to the left brain. Everything else switches over. Smell is the only one that doesn't. Yeah. So if I want to influence the right side of your brain, then you sniff things in through your right nostril alone. Right? Oh. If I want to influence the left side of the brain, I sniff in through my left nostril all by itself. And that stimulates the left side of the brain, which influences the what? the sensory inputs of the other ones on the opposite side of the body. <laughs> uh, right? So I think this... you can, you can play around with pain on one side of the body than yeah. just sniffing more in one nose than the other. Right. Amazing. Yeah. So smell is very, very powerful in that response to changing the, uh, what happens in the brain, but it also changes blood flow to the brain. So if I stimulate the right side of my brain, I'm getting more neural activity in the right side of the brain. So I just close my left nostril, breathe in through the right side. So let's say somebody had a stroke on the right side of their brain. Then I'm gonna close my left nostril and breathe in through my right nostril to stimulate the right side of my brain. That's also why yoga breathing, I forget the name of it, but you have altered breathing patterns through the nostrils. Anu, where you'll anu, close anu, anu, nostril. Anulum Vilo. Yes. Yeah. That's why that's so powerful, right? Because you do altered breathing in the in the nose. And then you can stimulate the one side of your sympathetic nervous system compared to the other. So a lot of people that have pain on one side of the body, for instance, like if your right side is really, really painful, a lot of people get pain just on one side of the body, right? Why is that? Well, it could be you have too much sympathetic response on the right side of your body mm. you have too much sympathetic on the right side of your body so what you want to do is you want to try to calm the sympathetics down on that right hand side so you just change like which way you breathe in through your nostrils okay? so it's many different ways that you can do it for now I'll make it easy just take a fragrance that appeals to you yeah. and uh, usually I have people do is this it's kind of cool you do a movement pattern you do like a squat, a toe touch, a lunge, you know, anything that you do that maybe is difficult for you to do, 
or you have a little discomfort when you do it, or it's painful. Then see if smell makes a difference in that movement and see which side. So let's say that you close your left nostril and you breathe in through your right nose. And then I want you to do your, do your squat again, do your toe touch again. See if your pain was a little bit better or it got, your movement got a little bit better or it didn't change at all, or it even got worse, because it could be either one. Then I want you to breathe in through the other nostril. So now you close the other nostril, and then you breathe in through that side, and then do the squat, then do the toe touch, then do the movement, and see if that made a difference. And very often what you'll find is, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Like you'll have a notice and you'll change, how easy you move, how well you move, your level of anxiety, your level of pain, just by switching nostrils. And then you keep breathing in that scent through the nostril that made you move better. Right? And sm smell goes directly in. Why the, the smell is so powerful? Because the olfactory nerve of smell goes directly into the brain. It doesn't go through the thalamus to get there. So there's no interpretation there. It just goes straight in. Boom. That's one of the reasons why this lovely thing called COVID likes to go up your nose. Because mm. it goes through the olfactory nerve and inflames what? Very quickly. Your brain. Because it's a direct access right into the brain. Bang. Just like that. And then the virus, the virus gets stuck around the olfactory nerve. Around what? The cerebrospinal fluid that coats around the nerves. And then they send it everywhere. Back to fluid again. Back to fluid again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's just a kind of a tiptoe into some of the reasons why you would uh, yeah, do that. that was Basically, I know I'll talk for 10 minutes on that, but it's really easy way to change blood flow and stimulation mm. to neurons in the brain. Yeah. Either right side or left side. Hmm. That was really helpful um the like they say the biopsychosocial model of pain like there's this biological component there the psychological component there the sociological social component to it so so many components that uh like contribute to the perception of pain so th when there is a loss emotionally that translates into biology there's a post of yours yes i would love to know about that in depth yeah so the Biopsychosocial model, BPS, it's mm -hmm. called model of pain. I, I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, you know, because you're you're a human being, yeah. right? And you have emotions and feelings, and you're gonna react to the world through the emotions, and that's through the stories that you're telling yourself, right? From everything from the stuff that you've been taught usually through your culture, your immediate surroundings. That's why your environment is so important yeah. in relationship to healing because they, they, um, they realize that the environment is the determining factor on how well you can heal or how you're going to get sick. It's called epigenetics. Hmm. And you, you cannot get well in the same environment that you became ill with it. Um, your physical environment, your mental environment, your social environment, and your fluid environment. Okay, going back to fluid. Right. Yes. So yeah, I mean, words themselves, language, body language, you know, they all will kick off emotional responses for you. And then that changes physiology because you're a human being, you're not a rock, <laughs> right? So we've all experienced this. You've been completely alone and you can think about a thing in your past where you had a lot of joy and you, you think about somebody that you love and your body changes, right? And then a split second later, I can ask you to envision a very painful, toxic moment in your life that you would soon like to forget. And then what happens immediately like a light switch, mm -hmm. everything changes. Your blood chemistry changes, your heart rate changes, your blood, everything flips. What the hell is different? You didn't leave the room. You actually did. 
Mm. You left it through your imagination. Yes. Right? Yes. You left you left the now. And where did you go? You went into the past or you went into the future, but you're not in the now. Because if you're truly in the now, you should not abstract. Mm. Right? Truly in the now. Because you realize that you can control the now. Your response to the now. So that's huge in relationship to the, the psychological model. But that's intricate, intricately tied to the social model because we're social creatures. We're not meant to heal alone. You can be alone as part mm -hmm. of your uh, healing process. It's called a sickness response where you're programmed to remove yourself to try to get well, but you ultimately need a community of people of support to be there for you or with you if you need it. So you've isolated by choice. You understand? That's a very big difference than being isolated by the group. Mm. Because that your chances of survival when you're isolated are zero. Yeah. So you're hardwired to not be alone for a long mm. period of time, right? And so that's why community is a huge part of healing. That's why you got to be really careful on the people you choose to hang out with. Because those toxic people will keep you uh, in the quicksand. They'll drown you. And in the world of sickness and medicine and diagnosis and labels, that happens all the time. You know, you get into a support group of this condition and then everybody wants to compare how miserable they are and oh, I'm worse than you or I did this or you try oh. to give some alternative to something and they'll tell you you're full of crap. You need to get out of that quick, fast, and in a hurry. <laughs> you, you remind me of... Uh... So I'm from India. So here, the middle-aged people or the old-aged people, when they get together, mostly, then like 80-90% of the conversations are around, oh, I have this pain, I have this issue. And the other person is like, oh, I have even more. I have this, I have that. And like yeah. the, the conversation is along those lines. And Yeah, your cells are always listening to your, to your talk, consciously and unconsciously. Right. This ones you say out loud and the ones that you know you don't say out loud, which are usually the more toxic ones. I mean, if you talk to another human being the way that most people talk to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. That's powerful. That's that's powerful what you say. But no, yeah. Yeah. But now, honestly, it's so toxic out there and we're so distanced from social media that people don't have any filters anymore. They say things to other people that they would never say if you were in front of their face, because yes. if you did, there's repercussions for that. The repercussion is I'm going to punch you in the freaking face is what it is. Right. <laughs> but when you're a continent away, then you feel it's a free for all. Yeah. And that's why you've gotten this increased stress response, but a detach and connection. So social media was supposed to connect us more than anything else. And it's done the exact opposite. It's disconnected People and isolated. Frustrated. People are frustrated from within. They're not happy with themselves. And that is why they take out yeah. their anger and frustration. Sure, because if I'm not happy, I'm not going to let you be happy either. Oh, but yeah. they'll put up pictures and videos and a facade that their life is perfect. And meanwhile, they're hanging by a thread of what's really going on. Yeah. Because it's all fake when you see so, it. So, so, so true. Uh, like, what I've seen is so if someone is in pain, like a lot of pain, and then he or she says that, oh, everyone else around is also in pain. Oh, okay. That's a relief because now you find like, uh, what to say? You're glad that everyone else is also in discomfort. That gives you comfort in your discomfort. Yeah. That is like, yeah. oh, this is how weird humans are wired. Like if I am in discomfort, if everyone else is in discomfort, my discomfort decreases. My sense of discomfort decreases. Like this is how pathetic humans can be. Yep, Matt, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, 
Perry, if you could, I mean, I mean, I know it's uh, n equals to one scenario, uh, case by case, but like some of the techniques that if people could do every day to improve their health, uh, like you said, massaging their abdomen, any other thing that you would like to add that they can add into their lifestyle, which can improve their health and prosperity? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, those are pretty powerful right there, honestly. So I usually tell people to pay a lot more attention to the front of your body than you do now, which means that, and I want you to start from the top down. If you can take the time to massage, rub, caress, show a little TLC love and attention to everything on your face and including your ears, right? Because it's highly neurologically powerful because that's where all your sense organs live. And so if you can pay attention to that region, it can decrease stress everywhere if you pay attention to that, okay? Then work your way down and do the same thing to the neck, hmm. all along the neck and along the throat. Easy. It doesn't have to be hard. Then go to the collarbones, massage above and below the collarbones. And then I want you to do the same thing to your whole sternum, all the way down. Rub your sternum, even take your knuckles in your hands and do what's called uh, sternum thumping. Just stump the sternum a little bit, because that'll vibrate your vagus nerve. Right? And then go down into the abdomen and then massage all around the belly and pay a lot of attention to your belly button, mm. your navel. Okay? Navel has a lot of emotion tied to that because that's the origin of your life. Because oh. okay? you had to be attached to another human being there called your mother. All right? And you have a lot of fascial tension and decrease in blood flow in that region. So you definitely do that every day. Then uh, make sure you breathe in and out through your nose as you stand up and just lightly bounce up and down a little bit on the balls of your feet like you're on a little mini trampoline. And then if you're open to it, if you're open to it and you're you're ready to receive this, if I say it to you and you think it sounds ridiculous, you're not ready to receive it yet. But if you are, I want you to do it. You can actually physically draw the shape of a heart on areas of your body where you're feeling disconnect, pain, discomfort, or anger, or vulnerability. So I'm going to give you some examples. I want you to do that on all the places I just told you, which means I want you to draw a figure of a heart on your face. So if you're watching me, I don't know if this is on video or not, but yeah, I'm just drawing a heart on my face from in between my eyebrows up and then down to the chin hmm. then do the same thing here start on the throat go underneath the jaw and then come down to the bottom of the throat like this like a heart draw a heart then holy cow you actually have a heart here in your sternum so then you draw a heart over your sternum okay and you can close your eyes and draw the heart and i and, and then do the same thing on the abdomen. Draw a heart right on the abdomen. Now, it really doesn't matter which direction you draw the heart. If you want to go top down or bottom up, just draw the heart. Do it two or three times. And what will happen is, is that you'll physiologically notice a change in your system. Because just the shape of a heart is a symbol that your nervous system responds to. Like it would respond to like a cross, for instance. It oh. kicks off emotion. And one of them is self-flow, right? And and giving thanks. Because you should be giving thanks to your body that they're doing the best it can with what it's got in the moment to heal you. That you'll physiologically feel different when you do those four hearts. And you're actually drawing them over energetic points that some people know about who's listening here called chakras. Mm. It's true. Your chakras, Right? from that when you get that energy going in there and then you can do that over any body part that hurts so if you have chronic pain in your left knee do all four of those areas i just showed you and then draw the hearts around your knee same thing 
And then you can send me a message on how you feel after that because you're going to feel it. Right? I'll do it. I'm, I'm really curious, like, what's your uh, usual day like? Like, what do you eat? When do you sleep? How much do you sleep? Uh, what's your training like, gym or other fitness stuff? So, I'm curious how do you Yeah, well, sleep is a big factor for me because if you're not sleeping, nothing's going to work. Mm. So I go to I go to sleep rather early and then I wake up early because I get most of my work done in the morning. Typically wake up at 5 a.m., sometimes at 4, but I just self-wake up. I don't have an alarm. I'm usually out by like 9, 9.30, something like that. And then uh, I usually wear a, a mask on my eyes to black out any light. I don't have my phone anywhere near me, and I tape my mouth shut at night when I sleep. So I'm forced to breathe in and out through my nose. Hmm. Yeah. And then uh, when I wake up, first thing I do is I have a glass of uh, structured water with a little fiber and collagen mixed into it. So I start my day off with some hydration. I do intermittent fasting, so I take 16-hour breaks from food. So uh, I don't eat breakfast until usually later because my last meal of the day is usually 6 p.m. Mm. So I don't eat usually until 10 a.m. the next day. I don't consider drinking coffee breaking a fast. So I have uh, coffee in the morning, coffee and my water. And uh, then I usually eat three meals a day. And I do training at the traditional gymnasium three days a week. But then I do some type of physical movement every single day, all the time. I read four or five books at the same time during the day because I love to read. I write every day. I post on Instagram every damn day. And I love to teach. So I formulate different things that I like to share with other people because um, sharing information and teaching decreases my stress response and brings me joy and i do a lot of energetic healing i work my limp every day i go on my infrared sauna every day i go on a full light bed i have over here i do bioenergetic energy medicine over here um every single day so i have a ritual that i do that i never skip it's always the same so most of my stuff is i'm kind of like a vampire i like to be up at night when everybody else is asleep and makes me feel like i'm gaining on the world that's what i like to do yeah, so that's my typical routine. Awesome. Amazing to know that like, you have systems set place, like very disciplined. Like this has to happen. Everything is scheduled and everything this has to happen. So yeah. Little and often over the long yeah. haul, man. Yeah. You don't have to sledgehammer everything. Consistency yeah. is the key. Yeah. I do a little bit all the time, year after year after year. It'll make you an unbelievable monster, a huge dragon. True. True. <laughs> you, you just got to how you got to look at it. Little bits. All one, the time. one thing at right? a time. Yeah. Yeah. You you compound interest that within a year, you're going to be a rock star. Yeah. Right. Anybody can do a lot of stuff for a short period of time. Exactly. And most people do. And then they quit. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. It was great knowing you. Learned a lot. Uh, I'm going to dive deep into the lymphatic and vascular system. Uh, you got me really curious. And <laughs> so, Good. yeah, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Uh, I mean, I hope to catch up with you sometime soon because I learned a lot. Amazing experience. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much for asking. There were some really great questions on there. And I, I could probably tell you that uh, the longer I do this stuff and when I teach my courses and stuff like that, it's <clears throat> I'm not so much into teaching techniques, um, you know, and tools and stuff like that. I'm more into teaching people how to think. Uh, right. Because if I can teach you how to think, then you should know how to use the tools exactly, and the techniques. Exactly. Because, That's what a true teacher does. Well, that's what they're based on, right? Yeah. How you're thinking. So it's understanding, you know, there's always got to be a reason why you're doing what you're doing. And then here's the thing you really need to understand. What do you do when something that you thought was going to work doesn't work? Uh, how do you respond? Yeah, yeah. 
So that's the, how I've learned the most is by what hasn't worked because that stuff doesn't upset me. It actually excites me because then I'm like, why is that? Then that forces you or it should, it should to look at other things that you weren't looking at before or look for connections that were outside your scope of where you were looking because you just didn't know that you should look there. So that's that's how you get really, really good in this business is by having things not work out. Hmm. If things would have worked out, I mean, everyone would have done it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, you wouldn't evolve. Well, see, that's the so. key right there, man. When somebody comes in to see me for help, I'm not the first one they see. I'm usually the last one. Yes. So what that means is this. I know they've tried a lot of other things and approaches and disciplines and gotten test after test after test that should have worked. Or seeing what is here or is what is not here. So when you come in to see me, I'm not going to do any of those. Why? Because yeah, you wouldn't be standing in front of me asking me for help because they would have worked and you wouldn't be here. Hmm. So I automatically have to think completely differently. So a lot of my heavy lifting in my work has already been done for me by someone else. <laughs> I just have to now explore areas that other people say, well, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. That we don't have any research to prove that. Well, exactly. That's why I'm freaking here. Because <laughs> if you had research to prove something, the person wouldn't be where they are. You understand? So I'm the crazy one that's the right in that moment. That's my world. Because I'm gonna look for stuff that nobody else is gonna look for. Yeah. The, 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 there's a line like if you are only waiting for research to say you things you are too late oh yeah it's like 10 years late anyway and it's so freaking <laughs> biased it's not even funny uh, exactly. and first of all most of it's freaking wrong <laughs> so you know how many times did it come back well we were wrong about that or we didn't yeah. see this or blah 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 i mean people saying they got research beyond something doesn't impress me one bit zero yeah. not yeah. at all because I have a lot of people that know the research, but they still can't get somebody well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a different ball game, man. That's the difference between somebody who studies how to fight and somebody who knows how to fight. <laughs> and they're like, show me the research. So show me the evidence. Like, uh, like... <laughs> yeah, they, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, whatever. That stuff is just... Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. What's your plan for the day? Um, um, after we hang up here, I'm going to head to the library, do some writing. People remember what libraries were, this place where they have books. Um, <laughs> you have one and then behind I'm you go. as well. <laughs> you have one yeah, behind I'm you. Go. I got a little bit behind me here, but the change of environment sparks my brain. Yes. And then uh, I'm going to head to the to the gym, get some, get some work in. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for the time, brother. I had a really Thank good you. a good time on the show. Yes. Thank you. Same here. Pleasure was mine. Thank you. I hope you liked this episode. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And I'll be coming up with such exciting episodes in the future as well. Thank you.